So who is God? And who is God on the day when we remember the worst terrorist attack that ever struck this country? Mohammed Atta, the lead terrorist, seemed to have led a normal and even privileged life. He was born in Egypt, he studied architecture at the University of Cairo, and then he moved to Hamburg, Germany, to continue his studies. And obviously, in Hamburg, he found God. And the God he found in Hamburg revealed to him that the infidels need to be killed. And so, Mohammed Atta learned to fly, he kidnapped an airliner, and then he flew the airliner into the World Trade Center. Mohammed Atta knew that he would die in that attack. But in his baggage, he carried a wedding gown, his wedding gown. It was not only the day of his death, but it was also his wedding day, when he would enter into paradise, as all martyrs do who die in Islam's holy war against the infidels, he would marry 80 virgins. He also left detailed instructions how his dead body should be treated. He obviously didn't realize that no physical remains of his worldly body would survive the attack. In the flaming inferno of the World Trade Center, his flesh evaporated as the flames that were fueled by his hate consumed it. And with him, many of the victims vanished without a trace in the nightmare of collapsing buildings and raging flames. And many phone calls were made by people who were trapped in the burning buildings. Even the people on the airplanes were able to use their cell phones to say some last words to people that were important to them. And if you read the protocols, you witness a lot of courage, a lot of fear, desperation, but also a lot of hope. People communicate calmly with their emergency services until the collapse of the building ends their call. People seek advice how to survive smoke and heat and flames and panic. But many take the opportunity to express their love for people that are important in their lives. Fathers and mothers and children, husbands and wives, friends and siblings, they all leave a last farewell and a testimony of their enduring love for those who are close to them on the other side of the line. In their last moments, their hearts were open to the enduring power of love. Is God a God of love who is present in these phone calls? Or is God the God of Muhammad Atta, a vengeful creature whose wrath is so much at the core of God's divinity that he commissions agents of doom who rain down fire and destruction on those who call him by another name. Is that all that there is beyond this reality, anger and fire and torture and vengeance? And Islam has by no means a monopoly on the angry deity. The Christian imagination of what God will do to those who God hates is worse than what the terrorists of 9-11 did to their victims. The trade center burned until it collapsed. But for people who end up wet, self-righteous, zealous, gleefully in vision as fiery hell, the experience of death has no end. The moment the body is consumed by the flames of hate is prolonged eternally. If that really is divine reality, all that is left for us is Job 2.9. Curse God and die. Since people dwelled in caves, there has been no shortage of human conflict. Bloodshed is so common that one could think it's the normal way humans interact. 
Our handshake, for instance, developed out of the gesture that was meant to assure the vis-a-vis -vis that there are no hidden weapons in our hands that will dispatch you to the eternal hen hunting grounds if you come too close. So whenever we shake hands, we assure each other of our good intentions and that we are not out to kill one another. Violence has fueled much of humanity's inventive power. 500 years before Jesus Christ was born, the Greek philosopher Heraclitus of Ephesus stated, war is the father and the king of all. And all throughout history, technological progress was mainly inspired by the desire to build weapons of war. Chariots and trebuchets and gunpowder, atomic weapons. Even the internet was intended to serve in the epic endeavor of humanity to kill one another. Naturally, violence also played a major role in religion as well. God was imagined to be just as cruel and as selfish as we are. Believe in me or I kill you. Worship me or I kill you. Follow my law or I kill you. Live as I tell you to or I kill you. And thus we end up with a violent religious imagination that spoke to Muhammad Atta and that drove him to kill and to destroy in God's name. But he's not the only one. Where Muhammad Atta went, millions went before him. And in all likelihood, millions will also follow him. The sword raised and ready to be destroyers of worlds for the greater glory of God. But if God is a God of love, then this is the ultimate form of apostasy. When human bloodlust imagines God's voice to tune in seamlessly and harmonize with the war chants of zealots of all persuasions and creeds, we overlook that God's voice is always a disruptive one. And when group dynamics boil over and when in religious frenzy we get ready to enforce God's justice, when we get ready to stone the next sinner, then Jesus steps into our midst and demands that those of us who are without sin throw the first stone. And then we look around and then we realize there is no one among us who is pure enough to be judge and executioner in one person. And then we have to make a decision to either drop our stones or to go ahead and ignore God's voice. Blessed are the peacemakers. Muhammad Atta was not one. He was a war maker who didn't want to hear that in God's kingdom, in God's kingdom, nobody is lost. All he cared about was destroying those he thought God hates. And thankfully, he didn't have to test that assumption because it conveniently confirmed all his preconceived notions of who God's enemies are. Valets of all flavors need enemies so they don't have to look at themselves, so they don't have to face the dark void in their souls where love and where compassion should reside. Martin Luther defines sin as the heart turning in on itself. Whoever imagines that God wants someone dead has a heart that is so completely turned in on itself that it has cut itself off from the presence of God. And if these people then feel the call to obey God's avenging angels, they do not do God's work, but in fact they work for the guy with the horns and the hoof. God does not hate. And if you worship a deity that calls for hate, you are not worshiping God. Most likely, you are worshiping yourself. You sacrifice others on the altar of your inability to love. And by doing that, in effect, 
you are denying God. God in Christ can always be found with those who suffer. He is with those who are broken, hurting, and cast out. Christ was and Christ is with those who died on 9-11 and with those who died in the wars that followed. The messages of love that the victims of 9-11 sent as last greetings to their loved ones testify to Jesus' presence in their hour of need. Christ does not take side in human conflict. Christ bridges the abyss that separates human beings by being always with those who pay the ultimate price for the human hubris to bring death and destruction in the name of God. We live in a violent and in a partisan world that seeks easy solutions. And one, one very, very easy solution is the imagination that Salvation lies in the destruction of the other. All that's wrong with this world has its source in the fact that they, whoever they are, that they are there. God is angry because they are alive and breathe and pollute creation with their presence. If only they were gone, then this world would be a better place. Often it seems the sheer amount of hate and short-fused readiness to destroy overcomes everything people of good faith could do. But that is not true. Do not, do not give in to desperation. There is nothing that darkness fears more than light. A light in the night can be seen for miles. It gives direction and it gives hope. The light provides a rallying point for all who are called by God to follow his way. The light testifies to the presence of Christ in the midst of evil. The light illuminates the way of love and peace and darkness cannot overcome the light. That is the promise of God. There will be light. Do not be afraid. Because Christ has promised to walk with us, to be with us, and also to die with us. No matter if we face violence like 9-11 or old age or anything in between, we are never lost. We are never forgotten. We are never expendable. And we are never hated. God's grace is on us all the days of our lives. And so equipped and kept in the love of God, we transform the world into the kingdom of God one good deed at a time. That is difficult work like a drop of water taking on a mountain. But look at the Grand Canyon. It did not fall from heaven. It exists because tiny drops of water did not give up. We conquer hate with love. We defeat darkness with light. We fight selfishness with community. That is a work that God calls us to do. And that is a work we will do. And in the end, God's justice will win and love will prevail. Amen.